and today it's the turn of our very own Angel of the North, Denise Wells! <laughs> <laughs> it does feel very strange. It feels I like know. a job interview. I know. <laughs> this is the first time you've been described as an angel. I can't. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yes. I was a convent girl for two years. Ah. Thank you. I'm excited to hear all this. Yeah. Because we all know so much I know, about each other. I can't really remember prison. much about life before Loose, but. Um, but well, you said you're, a, a, you're a, a, a good old convent girl. Tell us about your, your childhood. I was a good convent girl. Okay. <laughs> a convent girl. <laughs> you, you came from a sweetie dynasty. I did. My surname is, is Welsh, as you know, and um, my grandpa, my dad's dad, had a sweetie firm in Whitley Bay called Welsh's John W. Welsh, and they made all the jars of toffees and the boiled sweets and the humbug oh. when you used to go in a shop and get a quarter of this and a quarter of that. So that was John W. Welsh, that was in Whitley Bay. And then my Uncle Tom, who was my grandpa's brother, had Welsh's of Whitley Bay, so although they were under the same family umbrella, they were run as two separate um, en enterprises. So Uncle Tom's factory did, like, the... Um, I've gone Geordie even talking about it. Did like the bags of football shoes and stuff that you you know you would see like that. So Are you were very wealthy. No, 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 we weren't. People thought we were because ah. we were Welsh's toffees. So I was on the A-list of every party as a child. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I would turn up with a great big jar of oh. toffees and they made this super butter toffee. And my grandpa invented, for those of you who know, the black bullet. Oh, yeah. So he actually invented the Did black it? bullet, not just invented the Welsh's black bullet, the actual black bullet. And I remember going in the factory when I was little and um, the, the black bullet thing used to all come out like a great big sausage and the girls used to do cut and roll, cut and roll, oh. with their, every single one separately. And we used to get these hot black currant lollies hot out of the hot out of the oven. So I would take kids on a school trip and they called me truly scrumptious. Oh, you know, God. God. Oh, <laughs> have you got all funny, your own teeth? The funny thing... Well, <laughs> well, well After all I pretty something. much Finish. have. No, because I didn't have a sweet tooth. Oh. oh. No. I didn't have a sweet tooth until I gave up drinking seven years ago. Ah. And I, I mean, I always liked this and that, but the thing is, um, our house was because my dad was a salesman for the company as well, because he... I came along a little bit early when my dad was at university and my grandpa insisted that he left the, um, the university. Big mistake, he's regretted it all his life. And go into the family business, oh. which he thought he would on a temporary basis, but... He started yeah. earning money and Grandpa yeah. kept, him, kept him there. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was fascinating hearing about all the, the, all the family dynamics because yeah. my mum was from a sort of Irish Catholic family. She wasn't religious, but that was her background, who, who you know, really struggled. And my yeah. dad was... There's mum and dad there. So and were they you, were only, like, oh. 22 wow. then, which so is So were amazing. you always a jazz hands child? Were no. you always going to be no, an actress? No, I, I wasn't. I think that... It was always a party house because mum and dad were very young and rather than leave us to go to parties, the parties happened around yeah. our flat, which was tiny. I went back to it when yeah. I was older because my child's eye view of it was that it was a normal size and it was tiny. So I was, you know, surrounded by lots of people. And I have got photos of me sitting with hair curlers in and a pen like this. So there was a bit of Norma Desmond. At what age? <laughs> you know, about nine. But I wasn't really... <laughs> I, I always used to say things, uh, apparently, like, you know, I'd come downstairs at four in the morning if there were still people partying and, and saying, you know, can we go to the Rex, which was this hotel along the front. But it wasn't until I was about 14 and a half, 15 at school when I was a very unremarkable child. I was quite lazy. I didn't really like the academic side. I liked school because I liked all the, you social. know, liked all the social, not mm -hmm. the convent. I didn't like the convent. My mum and dad thought they were doing a good thing by sending me to this convent school because you got a half price deal. <laughs> and, um, what do you mean you got half well, because price? Two nuns for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> I say, say you buy one, you get one. Some, and I, probably, I hope I don't upset people by saying this, but because because I had been baptised Catholic to... to um, because my, my grandma, my mum's side, wanted to. I was never brought up as a Catholic. In fact, my, I decided at nine I wanted to be a Catholic. And so my mum pointed my sister and I, t who, was, who was six then, in the direction of the church, which was literally down the road, and watched us. And we went into the wrong church and became Christian scientists for two years. <laughs> <laughs> medicine for this and she's going where you, well, we'd been at the christian science church <laughs> <laughs> so when did the acting kick then so i was 14 and a half i think and um terry cudden who was the drama teacher at the school and it wasn't really a massive dra dramery school was doing finian's rainbow 
And my dad had met Terry through the amateur dramatic basis, so dad did a little bit of amateur dramatics, but I wasn't really that interested. And Terry Cutton said, we need somebody to be to be Susan the Silent, who doesn't speak. She just... <gasps> she just... <laughs> and they right, you. <laughs> she just dances her way through like this. And she has one line at the end, which is, I love you, dried. <laughs> dried on that line. Anyway, it was like... It was honestly like the whole rehearsal period and having to finish the class early on the day of the show. It was like people say in a cordy way, like a light went on. And I discovered something that I could do. Aww. And for once, oh, I was me at 21, yeah. And, 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 and uh, once, uh, 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 suddenly I was patted on the back for something at school. You had fun. You had I had a bit thing. of kudos, yeah. you know, and it was, and it was kind of, it, it, was, it was nice. And, but I still never considered doing it as a career. Mm. Because the school I went to, Constant Grammar, wasn't really a feeder school for for, for actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Alan Armstrong had gone there. That was that was about it. And so I was going to teach drama, and my dad and my drama teacher said, "I don't think teaching's going to be right for you. Why don't you go? <laughs> Why don't you go? <laughs> How drama, yeah. Why don't you go to drama school?" And I did. When I got to drama school, I realised I was in such a minority because most parents had said. Don't go to drama yes. school, be a teacher. Yeah. But my dad knew that I wouldn't be full yeah. happy in, yeah. in, in, in that. that. I mean, I played a teacher in Waterloo Road, obviously. I played where, a where terrible did you meet French Tim? Teacher. How long later was that? When I met Tim? Yeah. Well, when I left drama school, I was 21. And um, for those of you who know, at the time... Oh, my God. Mm. At the time... Um, you had to have an equity card in yeah, order to be able to that. work. So it was yeah. a catch-22 situation. You could only, was, you could only get a only card, get if, a card if you worked, and yeah. only work if you had an equity card. It was really very strict. So and most theatre companies had two equity cards to give a year, so it was a real battle on. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, to, I had gone to audition for a company called Live Theatre Company in Newcastle, and I had to do an improvisation, and it was with Tim, who I knew as Malk Healy. Uh -huh. And um, before Alvida's end, he had long hair. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. And we had to do this improvisation, which was set in a laundrette where I was meant to seduce him. And, um, and I did, and he turned it round at, at the end that he, was, that he was gay and everybody thought it was hilarious and stuff. And there was, I just thought, I just thought, oh, my God, he's such an idiot. Oh, my God, he's such an idiot. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was wearing these leatherette trousers and I was aware that he kept looking at my bum all the time. <laughs> and um, anyway... I went back to my flat in Palmer's Green in London and it had the old pay box outside the, the flat door. And I got this phone call and I got offered two equity cards within five minutes of each other. One was at Life Theatre oh, and one right. was at Watford Palace Theatre. Oh. So I chose that one because yeah. I lived in London at the time. So the tra trajectory of my life would have been so different. Yeah. If I... So Tim and I sort of rumbled along. He said that he always thought that I was a blonde flirt who always had a glass of wine and a fag in my hand. I mean, ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I always thought he was really grumpy and guarded and I thought he was a fabulous actor, mind. I really yeah. have always thought he's an amazing actor and still do. So what was and the moment it, then? Yeah. Oh, no, because we got invited to our friend Max Roberts, who um, was the uh, theatre di director, very successful theatre director. We went to his house and it was... Um, I, didn't, I didn't want to go, but I didn't know who was going to be there and I was really tired and I phoned up Max and said, Max, I'm really tired. Do you mind? I've just driven from Nottingham for some reason. Um, I don't, I'm not going to come. And he went, oh, my God. Every, everybody's here, he said. Annie's here, and he said, Robson's here, and his girlfriend, we're all waiting for you. So I went, and um, and that was that was it. I remember thinking, oh, my God, I've got this guy completely wrong. And he uh, drove me home that night, and everybody in my house, Mum and Dad were having a party, and they're all going, oh, it's Dennis from Alfida's Inn, she's brought Dennis home. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he got the guitar out, and he sang for everybody, and, and he wooed me, and that was, uh, and that was it. Aww. <laughs> Lovely. The one thing that really propelled her to stardom was her role as Natalie Horrocks in Corrie. Now, it's something that we... I know it's been a long, long time since yes. you left Coronation 20 Street. 20 years. But it's, it's a kind of go-to. You still get people stopping you in the street, don't you, going, oh, you oh, in Corrie. Still, and no matter what you do, it's ex-Coronation Street star, ex Stender star, isn't it? All the same. But, you know, I hold it in great affection. I did it for... I think people think I did it for longer than I did and that it was much less time since I left. Mm. You know, but you've got to remember that... But you that, were in the time when it was 20 Well, you've got to remember yeah. that the time I did it... Yeah. So I was pregnant with Louis when I left, so that's kind of like 18 years ago, 22 years ago when I started. But when I... When Natalie married Des Barnes, played by mm. Phil Middlemas, 
Our wedding was watched by 23 million wow. people. Wow. That was over a third of the country. Wow. So yeah. it was like, oh my God, look at that. So thin. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was phenomenal. Now, I remember at the time, Tim was doing a series called The Grand. And it was filmed in the blue shed, which was the Gen general chromium platers, round the back of Coronation Street. It was a wonderful series. Tim, Susan Hampshire and Jane Danson, who mm -hmm. plays um, Leanne in, in Corrie, mm -hmm. they were doing this ama amazing um, series. And I remember two series of it happened, big success, and ITV pulled it because it was only getting 7 million viewers. Wow. Think, now that would yeah. be hailed as a huge success, yeah. obviously, with all the advent of satellite channels. Anyway, so, yeah, it was... Um, so who are your pals in thing. there? Who are your pals? It was a very daunting time going into it. Bearing in mind, I was in my late 30s, and I think I have some parallels with Nat, because mm. I was in my late 30s, and I'd done things like Soldier, Soldier and Spender, so, I, I, you know, I, I was kind of used to people going, oh, are you her off the, off the thingy? But nothing, no, nothing can prime you for what happens when you go into a soap opera. And I went in there, and I like being alone. I'm very happy with my own company, and I need times of aloneness. But being alone and lonely are two very different things. And everyone thought I was having this brilliant time, and certainly for the first three, four months, I was incredibly lonely. I'd left the northeast where we'd moved back to. Matty was about nine. And I'd come down to do 17 episodes, which could be done in three weeks or four weeks, because you do that mm. many. And then they said, would you do some more? Would you do some more? Would you do some more? And my, all my stuff... A lot of it was filmed. Natalie's house was on location. So on a Sunday, we would go to Chorlton and finish, so I could never get home. Mm. Plus, everybody in the show pretty much lived in Manchester. And I just kept thinking, is anyone going to invite me for dinner or anything <laughs> like this? And I just felt really... I just felt really, really lonely for, for a time. So I always made it a point of mine that when new people came in, I would... I would make sure that they were all right. And I used to say, we need to get, like, a starter pack going. And mm. also try to look after the young people, because I could kind of deal with what happened to my life in my late 30s. But for the young people, their life can change very quickly. But I've made lifelong friends. Yeah. I mean, Sally Whitaker, Sally Dinova. I just saw her the other day. She's one of my great friends. Kevin Kennedy, who played Curly. Curly. Mm. He, um... He, he was, I mean, he's hysterical. And we both had alcohol issues during our time in mm. Coronation Street, and we kind of helped each other through those times as well. Charlie Lawson mm. is, is a big... And I think, you know, Charlie was not so long ago on the, um, on the show. One of my friends that people didn't know how close we were was Annie Kirkbride, who played Deirdre Barlow. Mm. She was just so... She was so funny. She actually dragged me off to get me belly button pierced once in the uh, year. <laughs> I quite remember why, why or how it happened. Any particular reason? I don't know. I just remember Annie Kirkbride dragging me off to Affleck's Palace in Manchester and making me get my tummy button pierced. And then when it was pregnant, I was pregnant, it popped off and I never saw it again. <laughs> um, she, was, she was hilarious. You know, it was the older people like... Eileen Derbyshire, who played um, who played Emily Emily Bishop, Bishop. Mm. and um, Sue Nichols, who plays um, she's fabulous. Uh, oh, she's such a good uh, Audrey, Audrey, Audrey. I mean, absolutely mm. hilarious, hilarious. Am Amanda Barry. I love it when those old, older people get the storylines. Yeah. You know. Um, but one of and the things, obviously, you showed the, the wedding there that was watched by, you know, 100 million people yeah. or something similar. Um, but the, the, the one scene, there's one scene that has sort of followed you around and it was because you were a very naughty lady on Coronation Street and somebody got very cross. Should we have a little look? Yes, please. Sally? Yeah? I thought you were in Scarborough. You might find Kevin at his father's flat. He lives there now. He's moved out and he won't be back. Natalie? Yeah? Oh, that oh. looks like the real thing. And you know, they made us really, they made us really do that. And poor Sally, because she is the loveliest person mm. in the world. Very sweet, gentle. Oh, no, no, I won't. Oh, no. I won't. <laughs> but she kept going. I can't. I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> and we had to say, you've really got to go for it. And she, and of course, that became iconic. I mean, that was that was front page news, yeah. and it was absolutely massive. And um, was it sore? Do you know, it was it was sore. It was really, really sore. But that was such a. That was a great storyline. It was so brilliant because nobody had ever 
would ever consider that someone who broke up the Webster's marriage would then go on to be a long-running character. Yeah. And when I was playing the real bitch, it was fantastic to play. To keep Natalie in the show, they had to soften her to the point that yeah. I nearly became Emily Bishop. Do you know what I mean? And then it was time, <laughs> and then it was time, time, to, time to go at yeah. that time. But it was... Um, I, you know, I still think that Natalie owns half the garage. <laughs> yeah, obviously, I've, I've known you for such a long time. We all, we all have, through your times on Loose before I came on board, and then, you know, you've been in, and come back again. And you've always spoken really fondly of your mum. Yeah, absolutely. And it was funny, you know, because I always used to... Um, my mum was, 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 my, was my rock, and, and she died um, seven years, 12, 30, 40, 50, 70, 12 years ago, yeah, seven years ago. And uh, she was a great loss. I mean, she used to come down to the show, you yeah, know, all yeah. met my mum. And um, I, I, the first thing I did after every show was I'd run upstairs and see what my mum had put going, I'm going to kill you for seeing that. <laughs> um, she also knew when I was poorly, when I had my depression, and even if I was sitting here smiling and chatting to guests and everything, I'd go up to my dressing room and my mum would say, you're not well, are you? She could see in, in my eyes. So mm. I, um, I, miss, I, I miss her. Uh, very much and I I think one of my big regrets in life if I if I have one is that she knew I'd stopped drinking three weeks before she died but I would love her to have seen the life I have now Aww. because I was in a dark place for you know for, mm. quite, for quite a long time but she did used to say that my TV success at the time ruined it for her because she'd been a Coronation Street viewer all of her life and she went I love it that you're in it but I just don't believe it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Did she ever call you Natalie? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess when your own daughter becomes the landlady of the Rovers, you kind it's of all over. the reality of it. <laughs> well, I mean, sort of coming full circle then, Denise, where would you say your life is now? How are you now? I am, I am great. I'm better than I have been. I'm still great friends with my, with my kid's dad. Both my kids are doing well. Um, I'm married to the most wonderful man who is, you know, if you have a soulmate, he's, he's it. Uh, we got sober together and so our, our sober life enables us to do so much. And it's not just us that it's benefited, it's the ripple effect it has on, on, our, on our families' lives who, who worried about us when we were in a bit of a state. So I'm still, I'm still working at 61, which, which is great. I can pick and choose a bit more. So, yeah, so life is, you know, I still have... My illness, I still have severe episodes of depression, but I know how to work through them and to mm. live with them more. And I feel great that, that, that 30 years on, we now have much more of an open dialogue about mental and illness. And a lot of that comes from you being well, so I've, 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 honest. Thank you. Woo!